Guess where I am? This is fascinating. Oh, it's a real treat. You probably know I really get off on exploring our great British yesteryear. They're just like changing room and lockers, these things, aren't they? I doubt very much whether there's hundreds of jackets and trousers in them. What is in here? Oh, loads of cables. It's like the machinery is actually facing that way, and if you wanted to repair it, then you'd open that and fiddle inside. It's amazing to be able to walk around here. This is my very own sneak preview. And yours too. It's like an enormous version of the cupboard under your stairs when you were a kid, isn't it? Just one metre was the most mysterious thing that I knew in my house, but here you've got, there's like about 500 of them. Today I'm having what I can only describe as access to all areas, a privileged pass. Lucky old me, eh? Have you got it yet? Yes! This is Battersea Power Station, the most famous disused power station in England, now lovingly brought back to life. I'm sharing with you an area that had previously been mothballed for over 40 years. Everywhere I look, there's a discovery. For the last four years, this historic treasure has been lovingly restored by a team from Lucas, the country's number one fit-out and finishing specialist. This is my chance to get up close to one of Britain's most iconic landmarks. The hub of a fascinating building that's been lovingly preserved and brought back to a quality of finish that's truly jaw-dropping. They've only just finished working on Control Room A and to tell me about how they did this extraordinarily complicated refurb, I've met up with Danny Lucas. Oh, wow. Danny, boy, this is fantastic. On a scale of one to ten, how pleased are you with what you've managed to achieve? Tony, it's off the scale. It's incredible what we've actually unveiled here. This is essentially a heritage job, isn't it? What kind of skills did you guys have that got you the work in the first place? Well, it's about the capability and the experience of the company and being able to really demonstrate that you've got the skills to deliver it. And of course, everything was about discovery and working out where we were with everything in terms of condition. So how the heck did you cost it if you were revealing new things week after week, fantastic things, but things you'd have to chuck quite a bit of money at? It was done in a collaborative way where we worked in a, in a staged fashion, working with the architect, working with the heritage team, um, working with the principal contractor. And staff, uh, skilled staff, you and I, you know, we're old geezers basically, <laughs> aren't we? But well, were you able to introduce young people in? Absolutely. We've got a young team on the company already and a lot of people have come into the world of Lucas because they've seen innovation, technology, and we were able to bring a lot of that sort of apprenticeship type skill set to the project. So what's going to happen in here? So this is going to be an event space, but for sure it is the jewel in the crown really of the power station, overlooking the amazing turbine hall. I'd love to be one of those people using the space. <laughs> well, that's how the work was done. But what else is there? Look at that. Whoa! Isn't that the most extraordinary set of dials you've ever seen? It's called a synchroscope. And what it's synchronising is this. You've got the electricity in the grid all over London, which is oscillating like that and you've got the electricity which is produced here which is also going like that but you've got to marry the two so that the two oscillations are in tandem and when they are you see that top dial there you see the arrow that's currently pointing down well when that flips right up and it's on that line between fast and slow then everything's hunky-dory and when it's not like that you're back. <laughs> 
you get a real sense of the geographical area that was covered by this power station from these signs up here. Look, you've got Arxbridge, North Hammersmith, Acton Lane, where I used to live and where we used to rehearse Blackadder, although you're probably not old enough to remember that series. Wimbledon there. See that one? Carnaby Street. It isn't actually Carnaby Street. It's code. That's actually the Buckingham Palace. But don't let anyone know. When the London Power Company commissioned the design for Control Room A, it wasn't just to look pretty. So those locker room doors, they were on the other side of there, so if something went wrong here, that's when you lose them and nip in the back. See these panels, these beige ones? There's uh, 185 of these, and on them there's more than 350 dials. There's 185 of these illuminated lights. A bit like clowns hats, aren't they? And you've got more than 300 levers and switches, all of it original. Oh, I so love these knobs. You don't get anything like this nowadays, do you? you just touch a screen. Much rather be doing that. Actually, a few of them have had to be replaced, like this one. These are wood, and they've been oversprayed with metallic paint, so they've got that authentic feel about them. To think this place generated electricity until 1983, it saw 50 years of active service. So much information bursting out of this wall. It's incredible that at its height, each shift, there were only three engineers operating the whole lot. And look round the other side. More meters, more dials, more monitoring. You actually need to walk 360 degrees down this whole enormous room and back up again before you begin to get a sense of the scale of the job that Lucas was confronted by. This is where the power was controlled to meet the demands of the national grid. And look at the loving way it's all been restored. The creation of missing components and labels and levers, the textured spray finish, which is appropriate to its time, doesn't look brand new, does it? It appears appropriate for its age. And this surface with the colour to match the original. Oh, don't you just love it? The thing about these is that they all look really dirty, don't they? They look grubby because actually they've, they've kept the patina that was here before they did the refurb, but they've absolutely cleaned it and polished it. So you just get this feeling of age. So why might there be these surges in power which these guys had to respond to? Well, here's a good example from a copy of the Radio Times in 1956. This bloke here is Norman Wisdom, and he was the most successful clown of his generation, a bit like Rowan Atkinson, but with a funny hat. And his show was on a Saturday night, and as soon as it was over, everyone would troop out into the kitchen to make themselves a cup of tea. And 1956, that's around the time when they started mass-producing electric kettles, so as soon as they went into the kitchen, the kettles went on, and voom, there would be a power surge. Normal wisdom's over. Wee, wee, wee. Come on, come on, come on. It's all right. There's 20 questions next. We won't need as much power for that. <laughs> See the light coming down on it? That is because of this ceiling, which is called a lay light. Really complex glass upon glass. And below it, see the scroll going all the way around the room, like something out of a Greek or a Roman temple. Then you've got this lovely marble wall. It's so nice to the touch. And below that, you've got so much parquet flooring. Can you imagine laying that? Even in 1939, when it was only half finished, architects said that it was the second most noteworthy building in the whole of London, topped only by St Paul's Cathedral. Sorry if I'm getting carried away, but I do love this place. 
You think this room is big, take a look down there. This is Turbine Hall A. There's going to be shops there that are in the process of being fitted. But in the old days, there were three massive generators in there pumping out electricity 24-7. At the time, these machines were the largest in Europe and they sat in this incredibly luxurious environment on a bed of Italian marble. I'm on my way to control room B now which is much more stark and kind of robust than where we've just been. It was built during the Second World War, 20 years later than Station A. And this is functionality. This is steel. It was filthy when it was discovered again. Imagine the number of Brillo pads that they must have used to get it like this. It's like, it's like these are kind of an army of robots, isn't it, waiting to move forward. And over here, you've got a completely different kind of synchroscope. This is the general moving his troops into action. What's great about this area is that it's going to be accessible to the general public. I've wheeled in Mike Barford from Mace. What's going to happen here? How are you going to breathe life into it? Well, this is part of um, Turban Hall B, which is a big, a big retail area. So this part here will be mainly sort of entertainment, maybe a bit of a bar, but it'll be buzzing around here. This is going to be a really buzzing focus point for London, I think. What was it like here before they got started? We came in and we did a survey, obviously, of what was here. We, we surveyed what we could keep and what we couldn't keep, and we surveyed what we had to refurb. And slowly but surely, but with care and attention and, and real sort of love, we brought it back to life and repaired it. It was a well-run project with people who, with, uh, who wanted to be here. How did you get involved with Lucas? Oh, I've worked with uh, Daniel Lucas for probably the best part of 25 years now, so uh, Daniel's a lot of work for us. He's a tier one contractor. They're very professional, yeah. number one. They, they absolutely are professionals in what they do, so tick. But their cooperation, collaboration, their can-do attitude, it just makes it a delight to work with. To be here now when life's been breathed back into it, it's a buzz even if you weren't involved in it. But I never realised how big it is. When you walk around it, it's absolutely gargantuan, you know. So I actually went to college around the corner in 1985 and my lecturer dragged us around here and we did a, we did a project on the, uh, on, on the building. It was uh, the largest brick building in, in Europe at the time, six million bricks. And that was in 1985, and here I was in 2017 as PD trying to, um, trying to bring it back to life again. So it's funny how the world just goes round and round, isn't it? So if Mike's right, next time you see this place, it's going to be full of happy shoppers. So enjoy the luxury of seeing it without anyone else getting in the way. As you can imagine, this wasn't the entrance that the cleaners used. This was the doorway for the directors of the London Power Company. It was to showcase the new age of what they thought of as clean power. This pair of doors epitomised the whole feeling behind Battersea. They're actually called power, these two figures. As you can see, they're stripped back, no clothes on at all, they're dead muscular, they're pushing against something really hard. They're very macho, aren't they? But I'm not. So when the directors first came in, they'd be confronted by this lovely, marbly, stony, crisp design. Then there's this podium here with what on it? A bunch of flowers, maybe? I don't know. Uh, there's the London Power Company symbol, and underneath it, the names of the directors. Sir Francis Fladgate MVO, the Right Honourable Lord Wargrave PC. They're not Cockney geezers, are they? And above them, there's beautiful lines of this ceiling, which is newly renovated. I do love a bit of plaster work, don't you? And finally, over here, I love this light. To me, it looks sort of limey green, but it's called amber. Whatever, it's very 1930s, isn't it? And here I am again, back in control room A, where I first started my exploration. This really is the finest piece of heritage work I've ever seen. It's a flipping amazing. Bring up some suitable music. And roll credits. 